what we will let reign in our mortal bodies. Not I should, not what we will let reign as opposed to uh, as opposed to sunshine. What we will let rule in our mortal bodies. This is where we choose what we will let shape us and mold us. Either the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, so that we are in the shape of the world, or the word of God, that we might be shaped in the image and likeness of God as he created us. Why then did this young man go away, away in sorrow when he heard what he had to do in order to have eternal life? If it wasn't because the Lord's word exposed the idols that he loved and had chosen to allow to rule, to rule in his mortal body, and that the Lord was requiring him to deny them, even to destroy them, if he wanted eternal life. It's the same thing that the Lord commanded Adam and Eve in the garden when he told them they had to give up that beautiful tree of knowledge. It's the same thing he commanded Israel when they took possession of the land of Canaan. They were commanded to destroy the idols as the condition for keeping the land because the Lord made it very clear to them if you follow after those idols and you become worshippers of those idols I'm going to expel you from the land just as I'm expelling the idolaters before you. Was anything forcing the young man to go away from the Lord and to stay with his riches? Did he not freely choose to deny the Lord and keep his riches? Did he not freely choose to let his, rich, his riches be the master that would reign, that would rule over his mortal body and not the Lord? Did he not choose to be the obedient slave of his riches and not of the Lord? And so it says he went away in sorrow because he wasn't going to get the eternal life that he was asking. Is this to say that he would not have been sorrowful if he had chosen to do as the Lord directed? What do you think? On Thursday last, we read from the daily epistle lesson from 2 Corinthians. St. Paul writes to the Corinthians, There is a godly sorrow that produces repentance leading to salvation which one does not regret. And there is a sorrow of the world that produces death. The Lord says, Blessed are those who mourn. In the upper room, as he is preparing to go to his voluntary passion, he says to his disciples, Because I have said these things to you concerning my cross and burial, sorrow has filled your heart. You will weep lament over my death, while the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. In the garden, the Lord was in agony, such that his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. But for the joy that was set before him, he endured even the agony so, no, the young man would not have been freed from sorrow if he had chosen to deny his riches instead of the Lord. But his sorrow would have been a godly sorrow. It would have led to repentance and to the joy of salvation. His sorrow would have been from the suffering that comes from denying one's idols and losing one's life enslaved to idols. By taking up one's cross, following Jesus, so that by uniting oneself to Christ and the likeness of his death, one can work out one's salvation in fear and trembling, putting to death all that is earthly in us, all the riches of our idolatry that make us into spiritual corpses, who, like the idols that we worship, we have given us eyes that do not see God, ears that do not hear God, 
hands and feet that cannot walk in the way of God that ascends to heaven. And so, dear brothers and sisters, when you hear someone say they don't believe in God, they're simply telling you that they worship the idols. This man's, our, this man's real worldly riches, however, were not material riches. They were the passions of the soul, the passions of the idols. And so are ours. We too are rich in the riches of the idols. Those, those riches include the passions of lust, greed, anger, envy, vanity, and perhaps at the heart of it all, this spiritual pride in which we prance about perceiving ourselves to be as though we were gods, which is the reason that God expelled Adam and Eve from the garden. But this godly sorrow that one engendered, is engendered in one's soul when one chooses not to deny the Lord, but to deny oneself and one's riches. This godly sorrow leads to repentance and to the joy of receiving the eternal life of the Lord's resurrection. Let's go back to the Lord's Beatitudes that we just indicated a moment ago. The Beatitudes begin Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I think all the Beatitudes may be describing this poverty that the Lord is calling the rich young man to, and us. It's a poverty of spirit that at its heart hungers and thirsts after righteousness longs to become meek and merciful and pure in heart in order to be not as though one was a God, but to be truly like God. And you see how godly sorrow engenders such poverty of spirit. How hungering and thirsting after righteousness engenders in the soul a visceral sorrow, how grieving a, a, a grief over how enslaved one is to worldly riches. For those worldly riches do not make us righteous. And if they do not make us righteous, they don't make us to live. They make us dead. They don't give us the joy of salvation and eternal life. Who that is rich has enough? always wanting more riches, in agony of soul. But as the Lord says to this young man, follow me and you will have riches in heaven. And so he says to us in his Beatitudes, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Hearing this word of the Lord, is there any uh, one of us who this morning finds ourselves responding, Oh sure, I can do that, no problem. It's a dangerous thing to draw near to God sincerely, seeking salvation. Because whatever he says to us will live out sorrow in us. If we want to be saved and have eternal life, we will have sorrow because we will have to put to death our love for our idols. And if we want to keep our love for our idols, we will have sorrow, because we will have chosen a life that's divorced from God, empty of meaning, and ruled by the fear of death. Who of us, when we examine ourselves honestly, the fiery light of the Savior's word can say, sure, no problem. Who of us does not feel sorrow on some level, somewhere deep inside, because we know in our heart that we do not have the desire or the strength to deny our love for our idols and give ourselves to this poverty of spirit that is required if we want to follow the Lord and have eternal life. And yet, even though we find that we do not have the strength, 
or even the desire. I suspect that if we look deeper, we will find that there is a seed of desire, a little seed, like a mustard seed of desire, to be able to give up one's riches, to follow the Lord of all. I think this word of the Lord is meant to test us. It bears us down to the faults and intentions of our heart. And it sets before us a choice. Which path do we choose? Do we choose the broad and easy path that goes down to destruction? Or do we choose the narrow path? The better and changeless path that ascends to go? Which sorrow? do we choose? For on both paths we will have sorrow. Either the godly sorrow that leads to salvation in the death of our idolatry and in the death that comes from our idolatry, or the worldly sorrow that produces death in our idolatry. Which death do we choose? The death that takes us back to the dust and that's it or the death that takes us into the Lord's tomb, the fountain of our resurrection. What if in this testing, even though we feel we cannot let go of our love for our idols, what if we choose even so not to turn away from the Lord, but instead to fall on our knees at his feet and say to him with the disciples, Lord, this is not possible for me. I cannot do this. I actually don't particularly want to do this. Lord, save me. I am perishing. Holy Scripture gives us to believe that if we chose to stay and not turn away from the Lord, we would hear what the disciples heard. Of course you can't do this. It is in fact impossible for you. Like the Israelites of old enslaved to the Pharaoh, you are enslaved to the devil who holds you in his power to the fear of death. Brothers and sisters, goodness sakes, even the Lord himself in his humanity would say in the garden, Lord, if it be possible, take this cup from me. The Lord, if the Lord Jesus were not God in the flesh, he could not do it either. But because he is God in the flesh, he can do it. And in fact, he alone can do it. Therefore, unite yourself to Christ. Let the word of the Lord rule in you. Because this word of the Lord, this God the Son, has united himself to our weakness. So that with the Lord dwelling and abiding in us, raising us from the bed of our spiritual paralysis so that we can walk, we can do it. For to the Lord who is with us, who will save us and deliver us, as the prophet Jeremiah says. Now St. Paul tells us this morning, I gave to you what I received, that Christ, I gave to you what I received, that Christ died for our sins. That he, was, that he was buried and rose again on the third day. Does that sound familiar to you? This is the same formula that St. Paul uses for the Holy Eucharist. I gave to you what I received from the Lord, that on the night he was betrayed, he took bread in his hand, so forth and so on. In our baptism, we put on Christ, who died for our sins who was buried and rose again. In Holy Eucharist, we receive his heavenly spirit who raised him from the dead. Christ, the word of God, who is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, is now through the mysteries, the sacraments of the Christ, of his holy church, he is in your mouth, and he is in your heart, and you can do it. We need only to present ourselves to God as his slave, 
and not go away. Stay there, just as you are. And what does God do to his slaves? He heals them. He makes them strong in his Holy Spirit. He fills them with such desire for him because he is the source of all beauty and of all goodness. And out of that desire that is engendered in the heart, as soon as she catches even a glimpse of the Lord, there is this strength that she has, that she receives. And she discovers she can do it. She wants to do it. And he raises us from death to life so that we can walk in his way. This healing of our soul, this engendering in the soul, even of a little seed of love for God, this is the proof that Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God. But he doesn't just heal our soul, he also gives his joy and his peace to us. This is the sign, the proof, that the Lord is raising us from death and pouring into our souls the living waters of his eternal life. Amen. Most holy God, save us. Glory to Jesus Christ.